You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. And on the podcast, we have started a new series looking at associate nations within cricket and how they are developing the game in their country. Many of us cricket fans know so much about the established cricketing countries and not enough on the associate nations who play cricket. So it would be, le- would be uh, nice to learn about those associate countries and via the podcast, people can also learn more as well. For today's Associate Cricket Series episode, we are discussing all things European cricket. Joining me to discuss and talk all things European cricket and associate cricket is Andrew Nixon. Andrew, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. It's great to have you here, Andrew, and very much looking forward to our chat today, and I'm, and I'm sure everyone watching and listening this episode of the podcast would feel the same as well, to learn more about associate cricket in Europe, because it's definitely growing, and there's a lot of teams that take up the sport in, the, uh, in Europe, so it'd be good to, to learn about that a bit more today. But, Andrew, before we talk about that, as I do with all my guests, I'd like to take them back to how they got into cricket, their journey into this great game of ours. And uh, it's been very fascinating listening to people's memories and recollections about how they got into cricket. So, Andrew, let's go back to the very beginning. Growing up, what were your earliest memories of watching, playing, and even going to the cricket? And if you had some cricketing idols, who were they? Yeah, so I I sort of got into cricket relatively... um late you know, I, I, my my fa- my immediate family don't play cricket they don't watch cricket it was my uh, mum's stepdad who was the cricket fan in the family who got me into cricket i he lived sort of in morecambe just on the lancashire coast i'm from lancashire um and <coughs> sorry excuse me um and one summer i was there and it was the england india series in 1990 so i would have been 10 going on 11 and that was the it was the Lord's test match where Graham Gooch scored three from 33 um which sort of fascinated me and then I think Capital Dev hit four sixes in a row to avoid the follow-on and Gooch scored a century again in the second innings great match uh one that's sort of stuck in the stuck in the memory ever since I suppose and that was sort of my introduction to cricket and I became obsessed with it uh, ever since um i i tried to play <laughs> tried being the the operative word i think i very quickly realized i was better at talking about cricket <laughs> than yeah. i was at playing it um I, I probably could have been an umpire if i'd have had the had the patience to do it um yeah. but I, I didn't have the patience or a score um <laughs> but yeah i so i yeah i so I've switched to sort of writing about cricket uh, sort of casually on an, my own, own blog. And then in in the year 2000, someone bought me a copy of that year's Wisdom. And although you know, I was a, a vaguely aware of the, you know, the teams that had played in the World Cup, so the Netherlands, Scotland, Kenya, yeah. Bangladesh was still an associate at that point. <coughs> um, and the UAE had obviously played in 96. Um, but I, I got that that edition of Wisdom and there was that cricket around the world section with all these wonderful stories um, as still exists um, about cricket in unusual places and one thing that really grabbed me the, in that because that was the centene that was the you know 2000 edition of Wisdom so they had lots of lists oh. of best players of the 20th century best matches of the 20th century and in that map that list of matches of best matches of the 20th century, there was a game that meant, that was mentioned between France and Germany. And I was, oh, I got France and Germany, that doesn't make sense. And then it was a, it was a description of it that someone had won, the winning run came from the French Lord, a batter, who got hit by a bouncer, wasn't wearing a helmet, staggered over to the other end and scored a head by, if you like. Mm. And the France went on to win by one run, and that was well. That's a really interesting story. Um, I want to know more about that. And 
you know, didn't really have access to the internet at, at much at that point. And but as so I went to the library and so sort of started looking around for evidence of this match, and you sort of stumble across various websites. And I found a report on the match and was I found the name of the player it was a guy called David Boards. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. Um, his French would be more David Boards or yeah. something like that. Um, and I have since met the guy, and he has a scar on the, on his head from which is obviously caused by the ball. Yeah. So he fractured his skull, um, and it was yeah. And as you sort of researching more, you start learning more about cricket in all these places, and it, it became an an obsession of mine. And it's like it's, I think it's like you discover um, you discover something that other people don't know about. You know, it's yeah. like. You discovered some. It's like when I suppose it's like when you discover a, a band that none of your friends have heard of, and you want mm. to sort of, you want to sort of tell people all, all about it. And so I started a blog writing about um, cricket in these countries, and that sort of carried on for a few years, just sort of casually writing about it. I think the the, yep. the moment I sort of started being a bit more serious about it was in. 2004. So this is, I think, this was my, to use a strange word, radicalization moment. There was mm. a tournament played in the uh, UAE. <clears throat> it was the ICC Six Nations Challenge. It was a 50 over tournament which involved um, Scotland, the USA, Ireland, uh, UAE, um, Netherlands, and a t- and a team that I'm forgetting at the moment. I- do apologize. Oh, Canada, that was the other team. Yeah. And it was a really exciting tournament. Um, it ended up with like Canada lost all five of the games, and the other teams all won two, lost three. So you had five teams separated by net run rate. And yeah. the USA won ahead of Scotland. And he was like, if if Scotland had scored two more runs somewhere else in the tournament, they'd have they'd have won the tournament. So really it was probably the first really good associate tournament. Um and the winners of that would qualify for the Champions Trophy in 2004 uh, yeah. and would be in the same group as Australia and New Zealand. And obviously that was the USA. And at the time of the qualifying tournament, there was a you know, press release put out by the ITC and they had comments from Ricky Ponting in it. And he was saying how much he was looking forward to playing the winners in the Champions Trophy. Come the Champions yeah. Trophy, Ricky Ponting was all... Well, these teams shouldn't be here. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a, mm. it, you know, a, a major international tournament isn't the place for a team like the USA. And that was, oh, hang on, what's happened? Yeah, you're now with twenty, nearly twenty years of hindsight of knowledge of how things work. I know that one or both of those things that Ricky Ponting said was was ghost written, and he probably never said yeah. either of them. But at the yeah. time, that was like, well, this is this isn't right. This isn't what. Cricket supposed to be, cricket's supposed to be about fair play. Yeah. It's you sort of like when you you're the illusion of what you, you've been told all your life. Yeah. And so if, ah, and that mm. and so it made me really angry. So I started getting more serious about uh, promoting associate cricket, writing about it. Eventually, I got offered to write for Cricket Europe, which is where uh, where I've written ever since. That started in 2006, and it's just sort of continued from there. It's a uh, you know, it's very much a, a hobby and a passion. Um, I, I often tell people the way to make a million from million pounds from associate cricket is to start with two million pounds. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's you know, you, nobody, nobody's getting rich from associate cricket yet, yeah. unfortunately, as much as I'd yeah. like to. Um, hmm. and yeah, I think I the the you get hooked by the sort of unusual stories and then you realize that it's 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 not just the unusual stories there's there's more to it there's some passionate there's some very passionate people who have been promoting cricket in some of these countries for a long time uh sometimes without any interest from the sort of you know cricket cricket's governing body and uh, the ICC and sometimes quite antagonistic approach to Growing the game uh, from yeah. I think, some full members, and um, you're criminally underfunded, which I'm sure we'll get into as we as, the, yeah. as our conversation progresses. And yeah, it's it's a, it's a fascinating part of cricket's world. I think as well, you 
you know, you see in associate cricket how cricket could be because mm. you know tournaments and you know we, there's lots of conversations around you know things like context at the moment. You know, associate cricket has to some extent always had that context, and, and I think I got into associate cricket as I say in the year 2000, and that was when lots of regional tournaments had started being launched, and these regional tournaments all had pathways. You had a Division Three tournament that led into a Division Two tournament, led into a Division One tournament, led into a global qualifier. The the cricket was had context. There were rewards for winning and consequences for losing. Sometimes mm. those consequences can be quite quite dire you know, you're talking about funding and you know it's like you know, the you can have a match where if you lose um you you're not going to be able to have a coach the next year not because the coach is getting sacked because he's lost but because you literally won't be able to afford to pay for a coach anymore yeah because you're not getting that funding that you would have got if you'd have qualified so it it becomes it became a as i say an obsession and i think you you see oh this is how cricket could be if people got their, uh, themselves together and yeah. thought about improving cricket. Because I think you know, a lot of cricket with full members now is just, it's cricket for the sake of playing cricket. Yeah, And I think it's, when we, we talk about the, I was posting about this on Twitter yesterday, when we talk about the rise of um, franchise cricket, I think that's because franchise cricket is, has taken the players that international cricket used to have. International cricket was the place where you saw the best players. You know, if you were living in England or Australia, the only time you saw Brian Lara play in the 90s was when the West Indies were touring. Mm. But now the modern day equivalents of Brian Lara, or let's say, let's say Virat Kohli, you can see him on TV quite regularly. Yeah. Um, and you know, I can see Australian, I can watch the Big Bash League you know, you know, this, this week if I want to. Yeah. I can watch the IPL in a few months. I can watch cricket from all over the world. And international cricket has sort of lost that place, but international cricket hasn't really changed how they do things. It still yeah. will go on a tour somewhere, will play someone. It doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Now, people sometimes get angry when you talk about, oh, the Ashes don't really mean anything. And I think, you know, to some extent they don't. You know, there's no consequences for losing the Ashes. You know, England played terribly in the Ashes for... You know, 20 years nearly, and nothing really happened. You know, yeah, um, you know, nothing, you know, England are still allowed to come and play Australia, um, po probably a little bit too much. Um, I think yeah. you know, these days, you know, especially now we've got you know the three formats, and yeah, I think you you learn what a sort of privileged position those full members have in terms of being able to organize fixtures and being able to pay the players and um you know when people talk about oh we can just get rid of bilateral cricket so well, hang on that's not really the case for most cricket playing countries mm, but yeah. the cricket playing countries you actually pay attention to it probably is um yeah. so it's yeah it's it's a fascinating area of cricket and i'm sure we will get into it a bit more as we as we talk yeah well that was great hearing about your journey and i couldn't agree more with what you said about associate cricket and you know, trying to grow and promote the game. I think that's paramount in the growth of the sport going forward. Absolutely. And that's why we're doing this series on on the podcast, mm -hmm. learning more about these associate teams and speaking to people like yourself and people who are involved in associate cricket to get a bit of understanding of, of how it all works. Yeah. So I couldn't agree more there. Um, and I thought to start this interview, Andrew, I thought we'd talk about uh, the history of cricket in Europe because um, you learn so much from the game's rich history, as, as you know. And um, the history of cricket in Europe is quite interesting. Um, and, you know, many of the associate countries that play cricket in Europe have a connection to cricket in some shape or form um, going back many, many years or, mm -hmm. or even in this current era or something like that. Um, and obviously we know that England have a rich cricketing history in Europe because that's where the game started and that's where it became to be. Um, so, Andrew, give us a bit of a brief overview of the of the history of the game of cricket in Europe. How did how does it tie into all of those countries? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's 
it varies country by country. There's essentially been um, two main waves of cricket coming into Europe. The first wave happened in mostly in the sort of late 19th century, where English workers were be, were moving to various countries and bringing cricket with them. Sometimes it stuck, sometimes it didn't. So, you know, Denmark is a good example of this. So it was introduced by English railway workers in the late 19th century, and it stuck around. Um, other countries, it was introduced and then sort of hung on for a few years, and then as English workers moved away, it, it, it sort of died out. And, you know, like Belgium, for example, where, you know, I think people will probably be vaguely aware of the first ever Olympic cricket match in 1900 between England and France. The French team was all expatriate English people living in Paris. Um, I think the one of the clubs that provided most of the players on on their Twitter account, this, I think it's a standard athletic cricket club, still describe themselves. We supplied the ringers for the French cricket team at the 1900 Olympics, um, which I think is a very uh, uh, nice way to to look at things, and which is quite common in associate cricket. And um, you know, as I said, sometimes the game stuck around played by a very small amount of people. And then there was a sort of another wave of immigration from the subcontinent in, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, uh, so from India and Pakistan, where they brought cricket with them as well. So there's two sort of distinct waves of cricket being introduced. And in some countries, it happened in happened both times. So Denmark's a good example where it was introduced in the late 19th century, carried on for a while, Denmark, had a very good team in the 70s, very nearly qualified for the 1979 World Cup. Just to go into that, into a bit of detail, bit of detail which is quite an interesting story, um, the ICC trophy, as it was then, now the World Cup qualifier, was played immediately before the World Cup. 15-team um, tournament, three groups of five. What was going to happen was the group winners and the better in a row would qualify for the semi-finals, and the semi-finals, the two winners would qualify for the World Cup. Um, Sri Lanka were scheduled to play Israel in their penultimate group game. Uh, the Sri Lankan government at the time didn't have dip diplomatic relationships with Israel and told the team not to play the game. So that game was awarded to Israel. So Israel technically have an international cricket win over Sri Lanka. Um, it was by forfeit, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah interesting little fact for you. And the what happened was that that meant that Sri Lanka were the bottom seeds in the semi-final. If for the semi-finals where Denmark were the top seeds, that meant Denmark played Sri Lanka in the semi-final. Had Sri Lanka played that game against Israel and probably would have won the game against Israel, Denmark would have instead played Canada in the semi-finals and Denmark had already thrashed Canada early on in the tournament and therefore would probably have got to that World Cup instead of Canada. Uh, which obviously Canada and Sri Lanka qualified. And then, so Denmark had this team of ent you know, entirely sort of, and I hate using the word native um, Danish people. Um, and, you know, a lot of Danish cricketers would play county cricket. Ollie Mortensen would be the, the most famous, played for Derbyshire for a number of years, um, known for a, known as a, yeah, pretty terrible batsman. Um, but he played for Derbyshire at the same time as Devon Malcolm, who, also known as a pretty terrible batsman. And what Ollie Morrison was so bad that Devin Malcolm batted ahead of him in the order. So that gives you an idea of how bad a batter Ollie Morrison was. <laughs> uh, although he claims to have scored centuries in Danish domestic cricket, but I think all ballers claim to have scored centuries in club cricket somewhere, don't they? So that's, that's, that's nothing new. Um, and uh, so there's this, then there's this wave of immigration into Denmark from the subcontinent. And now you'll you'll see a lot of Asian names in the Danish team. Most of them are born in Denmark. You know, they're so you know the second, even third generation of the of the Asian community in Denmark. So you've got Denmark's a good example of where you've had both sort of waves happen. Other countries, you had the English wave happen, died off. Asian wave happened. Other countries only had the Asian wave. More recently, as well as Afghan refugees have come into some European countries. There's been a, another sort of way that's happened a lot in Germany, where there's been a lot of Afghan refugees. Germany's national team even has a former Afghan national team player in it, um, whose name escapes me, Dolat Ahmed Zai, I think it might be. Um, so, yeah, you've got 
uh, there's a sort of third wave sort of starting to happen in some countries as well now. Yeah, yeah that, that was uh, good to hear. Um, a, a brief overview on the on the history of uh, cricket in Europe. It's very fascinating. Um, and I'm sure people would have learned more from your uh, from your summary there, uh, which is fantastic. Um, I thought we now talk about, Andrew, is the, the national teams, women's and men's, that play cricket within Europe. Um, and it would be good to gain your insights on some of the teams and learn more about their achievements, what they've done, their history a little bit, the players' stories, because, as you said before, many of the players come from diverse backgrounds to play cricket in Europe. And uh, so it would be interesting to hear your insights on on that. Um, uh, so for those who may not know, Andrew, uh, a lot about the teams in Europe, um, women's and men's teams. Can you tell us a bit more about them, the players, some of their stories, et cetera? So, yeah, obviously the, you're the top team in you know, continental Europe is, is, of course, the Netherlands. I know you have, you've had Bertus de Jong on the podcast, so I won't. I'm sure he's got into a lot about the cricket history of cricket in the Netherlands. But you yeah. know, I think people know Dutch cricketers. Um, a lot of some of them play in Australia, some of them play in England. Um, in terms of other, you know, Denmark's another good example. I mentioned Ollie Mortensen, Amjad Khan, who played for England, even um, a couple of times. Originally played was originally from Denmark. Played in the Under 19 World Cup in. 1998 for Denmark, uh, played a few times, played in the 2001 ICC Trophy, the qualified for the 2003 World Cup, um, eventually switched to England, then switched back to Denmark. Um, other Danish players, Soren Herriksen, uh, played for Lancashire, which is my, my county. Um, in other, other sort of top countries, you've got the Channel Islands, which has obviously got British... Obviously, is a, a British islands. Uh, Jersey and Guernsey are probably the other two sort of top teams, top associate teams in Europe. Um, obviously, cricket there has a very long history because it's you know it's British. There's some fascinating players coming out of uh, Jersey in particular. They are, they have had a sort of key squad now for almost a decade of very young players. They tend to start players quite young. They'll come into the national team. At, 14 or 15 and I've sort of stuck around. John T. Jenner is a very um, talented player. Started playing for the national team at 15. I, I saw him about just over 10 years ago. He was playing under 19 cricket when he was only 14 and was quite easily the best um, uh, player on the team. He played a little bit uh, in the Sussex system in England. Uh, but unfortunately, I think it just didn't sort of work out for him, um, which which surprised me. But I still think he he can play a county cricket. Um, so sort of France, um, obviously, I mentioned the story about uh, winning the winning a tournament with a head by uh, David Boards. Uh, a lot of good players in France. Um, there's been a sort of renaissance almost in French cricket uh, recently. Unfortunately, there's a bit of scandal in French cricket at the moment, which people may have heard of, yeah. where um, results of women's matches have been faked to try and get ITC funding. That's nothing, nothing new about that in in a, in European cricket and in associate cricket in general, where um, a lot of ITC funding is based on sort of self-reported census figures, and there has been. I'm going to choose my words very carefully. Um, encouragement to uh, inflate some of those figures a bit. Um, yeah. I'm not going to say who's done the encouragement and who who has been encouraged because uh, I don't want to be sued and I can't afford a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and so, but yeah, that's that 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 didn't surprise me, which is a shame because the French women's team has sort of come on and leaps and bounds in recent years. Um, Germany, again, um, cricket introduced there, I think, in the 20s by English residents. There's a, there's a um, very good book, which, which the name of which is escaping me now, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and remember. But oh, where a gentleman of Warwickshire team toured Germany uh, in 1936, so during the you know, Nazi era, and... 
it's a, it's a very very good book. I recommend people sort of look it up and, and read it. And cricket sort of became, you know, it was an English game during the Second World War, so it died out and then sort of came back with first from English troops um, stationed in Germany. And that, that sort of link has sort of continued today. There's a, there's an umpire who umpires in county cricket now by the name of Paul Baldwin who originally started as an umpire in British forces matches in Germany um, and was for many years listed as on Crick Info and Cricket Archive as a German umpire. Um, And obviously now he umpires Carrie Cricket, but he umpired a lot of associate tournaments in the late 2000s, early 2010s, and now, as I say, umpires in counter cricket. I think he was one of the umpires... The other year, where there was the crossbow fired into the oval, people may remember. I think he was yeah. one of the young guys uh, for that for that game. And yeah, so Germany, as I say, there's a lot of uh, good players in their their national teams. Or Dola Amadzai, I think, is the Afghan who now plays for Germany. Um, Belgium has played cricket for a long time. They were invited to the <coughs> first Olympics tournament in 1900, never turned up. Um, they've had. Um, they had a guy whose name is escaping to me. He's one of my Facebook friends, but who was very a, a big name in Belgian cricket into the eighties. Belgium even were playing three day cricket, you know, multi day cricket, international cricket in the nineties um, against places like France. And yeah, and, and Eastern Europe has been where the sort of main sort of Indian and Pakistani immigration has come has come in in recent years. You, what, you tend to see something very interesting that the men's teams in these countries tend to be mostly uh, Asian expats, whereas the women's teams tend to have more local players um, yeah. in them. You see that in Italy. You see that in uh, places like Estonia. Um, Estonia have a fascinating cricket ground there. Um, and I know that I happen to know about this because there's a story here that involves um, Shane Warren, believe it or not, um, where... It, um, they have a cricket ground that's in the middle of a harness racing track, so like people on like you know like chariot racing almost, yeah. Yeah. where you know there's horse races going on around where whilst cricket's being played, and some friends of mine had covered a tournament. Uh, some of my colleagues at Cricket Europe had covered a tournament there, and the captain of the Estonian cricket team, a uh, guy I think it's Tim Heath at the time owned the poker site that Shane Warne was at, did adverts for. Yeah. So he somehow got Shane Warne to turn up at this like tournament in Estonia. Um which um and you know, he turned up he says when he was uh, you know going out with Liz Hurley. So I think people were probably more interested in Liz Hurley than Shane Warne at the time, um, yeah. as which perhaps he would be. But yeah, um, so he turned up with Liz Hurley to a cricket tournament in Estonia, um, of all places. Um, you know, and most of Eastern Europe now have have, have teams. Slovenia, Slovenia is an interesting one because cricket was introduced there in a slightly different way by a, someone who'd gone to England to visit a pen pal at a sort of extended stay over the summer introduced and was discovered cricket and brought it back to this little village in Slovenia and all his friends started playing cricket and that's how cricket ended up in Slovenia of you, you so you have these weird sort of stories and um if you look up the of the Slovenian national team on Wikipedia there's a bit more about it on there they sort of introduced cricket into this little village and there was sort of 24 of them who would form two teams and play against each other and that sort of continued for about 20 years until they sort of grew up and left and, and whatnot. But eventually cricket sort of came back with that wave of Asian immigration. Um, Slovakia have a team. Um, Serbia have a team. Serbia have a very good international kit. I recommend people look it up. Um, uh, also Scandinavia, I've mentioned Denmark. Norway have a team, uh, which is introduced again by Asian immigrants. Um the and uh, Sweden play almost everywhere in Europe now has a national team. Austria um, is a is a good example of what you see a lot in Europe, of, where you've got a family who will get quite involved in cricket. Yeah, um, a guy by the name of Andrew Simpson Parker, who 
from England, married an Austrian uh, lady called Karen. Uh, Karen Simpson Parker actually played for the Austrian men's national team when they were short of numbers. She'd gone as the scorer, and oh, we, we're short of a player. We need to, we need to, <laughs> we need to re recruit our scorer, uh, which is yeah. something you often see in <laughs> associated cricket. It was a, it's a classic example. I was following a match. I think it was the Czech Republic team on Twitter, where um, the guy who was running their Twitter account and live scoring this match said, "Sorry, we're not going to be able to do any updates for a while. I've got to go on as a sub fielder." Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, you usually see that a lot in Europe. It's just quite sort of endearing in a way. Um, yeah. So obviously, Andrew Simpson Parker and Karen Simpson Parker are now um, their son. Mark plays for the Austrian national team. Their daughter, who uh, his name escapes me, is sort of about on the verge of making the Austrian women's team. So you see a lot of these sort of family links um, yeah. you know, throughout European cricket. You know, you'll often see, and you, you see this in the Netherlands a lot. Obviously, you know, Baz Delida is Tim Delida's son, and there's some sons of former cricketers, Dutch cricketers, coming through into the. Um, into the Dutch youth setup now and into the Dutch national team. There's um, three triplets who have all played for the Netherlands and let me see if I can remember their names. Uh, Sakib Zulfika, Asad Zulfika, I think Sikander Zulfika. Their dad played for the Netherlands in the 1996 World Cup. So you, you, you've seen the second generation of Asian immigrants in some countries now play, play for the national teams. So yeah, there's 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 a wide variety. It, I've not even mentioned Italy. Um, Italy, um, one of the top associates. Um, you see Italy sort of benefit a lot by Italy has a very sort of generous nationality by descent uh, rules. Whereas I think a lot of countries, it's first generation born abroad gets citizenship, and every other generation doesn't. Yeah. Italy has a. If you've had an Italian ancestor who left Italy in the 1880s, you can probably get an Italian passport. So you see a lot of Australians with Italian heritage and a lot of South Africans with Italian heritage play. Um, Carl Sandry, who played in the Big Bash League, I think for one of the Sydney teams um, a few years ago, uh, was a very um, a, a sort of big Italian player. He even coached Papua New Guinea as well. Um, the oh, His name's escaping me. He's a county cricketer who... Uh, players for Italy, uh, recently retired, who's now the Italy captain and coach. I should be able to remember his name, but it's just, <laughs> it's gone from my head, as it tends to do when you waffle on. But yeah, it, it's, you, you don't have to go very far to find a national team in, in Europe. And there's always fascinating stories around many of the players, how they, you know, especially when you have a, you know, someone who doesn't have that, ancestry from a major cricket playing country how they got into cricket is often very as you like mentioned the guy in slovenia who got into it from a pen pal you see a lot of stories so similar to that i was on holiday in england and i got hooked on cricket i was on holiday in australia and i got hooked on cricket um you 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 see, you see a lot of that and you know, I think people i think your know, cricket often sort of makes out that it's a sort of impenetrable sport that it's really hard for people who don't know it to understand and yeah. it isn't really i think you and i both know that it's yeah. it's actually a very simple sport i think any sport the basics of it are very simple they and you learn the rest as you as you play as cricket i think has a tendency to put barriers and that happens yeah. at all it happens at the grassroots level and it happens you know, at the international level as well. So, um, yeah, it's like people can get interested in cricket without any cricket background. Uh, Romania is a good example of that. Pavel Florin, who sort yeah. of discovered cricket. Uh, you know, people will definitely be aware of Pavel Florin, who went viral a few years ago with his unusual yeah. bowling action. And, you know, he discovered cricket just walking past a park and seeing it being played. And he tried all sorts of sports. He played American football in Romania as well. And, you know, he's a, he's a big, burly guy. You can, you can sort of imagine him playing rugby or American football or something like that. And he sort of got hooked on cricket. And he, he started playing cricket at 38 and played and has played T20 internationals, um, you know, since status has got expanded. So you, you, you have very, you know, very interesting stories of people who have discovered cricket in 
unexpected players who have just seen the game and thought, I want to yeah. try this. And I think sometimes cricket stops, tries to stop that happening. Um, yeah. Um, so where cricket tended to fade out in, in Europe, it was it tended to be where it was introduced by sort of more upper class English people who yeah. like to keep things to themselves. And um, you, you know, this is a story you see a lot in, in, you know, throughout the world in cricket where cricket was introduced by sort of English aristocracy almost. And yeah. well, not necessarily aristocracy, but, you know, upper class English people yeah. who didn't let, you know, the locals come and play with them. And, I think the you know the teams that are now at the top of the game are essentially the the countries where they did let the locals play, <laughs> and yeah. the countries that the associate members of countries tend to be where they didn't let the locals play. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. As I, as I say, there's all these great stories, and um, far more than we I think we can get through in in the time we've got. So <laughs> well, there, as I said, you know, there's there's so many to to talk about and so many teams there's like 33 teams if you include obviously the two full members which is england and ireland and then you have yeah. the, the other teams that come after that so there's a lot of teams to discuss and talk about so many great stories and i and i suppose that's the thing with associate cricket not just in europe but in other parts of the world as you said mm -hmm. they have funny ways of getting into the game isn't that right yeah um there's you you you, you see a lot in the Pacific Islands, in particular, where they have long family histories in mm. in cricket. There's the Emini family in Papua New Guinea is a good example of that. In fact, the main ground in Papua New Guinea is is Amini Park, where um, there's sort of two two uh, recent players on the men's team who are Aminis. A player, a recent player on the women's team was an Amini. Their um, Dad, uncle, and mum all play for Papua New Guinea. Their granddad play for Papua New Guinea. Um, you see, very, um, you know, Fiji is a good example of a of a of a country that's had a really long history in cricket. Um, toured New Zealand in the eighteen nineties, um, where the one of the players was the governor general of Fiji at the time, a guy by the name of John Udall. You may recognise the name Udall in cricket because he's the great grandfather of Sean Udall, who played for England for a few years. Um, he Fiji again toured in New Zealand in the fifties as a guy whose name is normally shortened on scorecards to Il Bula. I won't pronounce this full name; it's got about fifty letters in it. Um, look him up on Wikipedia, and you'll see how it's. Uh, yeah. I can see his full name. He's, I guess, he's got the longest name of anybody, longest surname of anybody in. in Even Sebastian. longer than Chimenda Vasa's name. <laughs> well, Chimenda Vasa only has a four-letter surname, so um, <laughs> he's got the longest surname in international yeah. cricket. Not necessarily the longest name because Chimenda Vasa has about eight names or something, doesn't he? Um, mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Fiji as well. Um, Neil Maxwell, who. Uh, played in Australia and New Zealand for a number of years, was born in Fiji, played international cricket for Fiji up until, I think, 2005. Um, you know, so you see a lot of um, un unexpected links. I think um, there's a guy in New Zealand, um, Sean Sawyer, who scored a double century recently in New Zealand's domestic first-class competition, the Plunkett Cup, who's a Samoan international. Um yeah, I think New Zealand A recently had a team that had a former some a, a current Samoan international, a current Dutch international, a former Dutch international, and a former Hong Kong international. So um, you know, people sometimes uh, have a go at England for picking players from other countries, but other yeah. other countries do it as well. Tim David, yeah. um, obviously yeah. plays for Australia now, played for Singapore before, yeah. was born in Singapore because his dad. Played for Singapore. Um, had, he'd moved there for work, started playing for the Singapore national team. So even there, Tim David, who you wouldn't think had a family link to an associate member, does because his dad played for played yeah. for Singapore as well. Um, yeah, so you get these um, these unexpected links in some places. Africa is a good example of fam where families have played. You'll see a lot of brothers playing for Kenya or for Uganda, and now you're seeing the sort of second generation of cricket play cricket players in those families. 
you know, it happens. It happens all over the world. South America is a very good example. Um, Argentina of a player who I'm a bit obsessed by uh, called Alejandro Ferguson. And this is a, this is something you see a lot in uh, Argentinian cricket because the cr- game was introduced by British people who have since yeah. sort of married into Argentinian fans. So you see a lot of hybrid sort of Spanish and English British names. So Alejandro Ferguson was a Diego Lord, Esteban McDermott. You see these wonderful sort of hybrid Spanish and yeah. British names. Alejandro Ferguson made his debut for Argentina in 1994 at the that year's uh, qualified for the 1996 World Cup. Still plays for Argentina today. Um, so he's approaching 30 years international cricket. His dad Tony played for Argentina for 30 years. His granddad, whose name escapes me right now but he played for Argentina for 30 years Argentina played first class cricket um, in between the two world wars and had a very good team at that time there's a, a guy called Clement Gibson who played a little bit in England but was one of Wisdom's Cricketers of the Year during the First World War where they gave cricket Cricketers of the Year to schools cricket he was playing schools cricket in England but was born in Argentina spent most of his life in Argentina and played cricket for Argentina um, and there was a guy who played for Somerset called John Jackson, who played for Chile. Um, Chile was playing international cricket as early as the in the early 1900s, dipped out, and then it came back in, like in Europe, with a wave of Asian immigration. Um, Mexico has a long sort of cricket history. One of the, the, um, the there's a photo of the Emperor of Mexico as he as he calls of Maximilian something. Um, in in the late so in the Victorian era, playing cricket, um, yeah, and there's a there's some wonderful photos as well of during the nineteen ahead of the nineteen eighty six football World Cup, um, England were having a sort of pre tournament camp um, at the Reformer Athletic Club, which is a football and cricket club, um, and the England football team played a cricket match against the cricket club while they were there. So you've got like Gary Lineker batting and John Barnes running in bowling. Um, <coughs> some fascinating photos there. Um, I think I didn't mention there as well like when I was talking about Italy. Um, AC Milan was founded as Milan Cricket and Football Club. It was a cricket club first, and now is one of the best football clubs in in the world. Yeah. You see, you see that a lot. I think Genoa as well started as a football and cricket club. So you see, you see a lot of multi-sports clubs that started as cricket clubs, but are now perhaps better known for other sports, mostly football. Happens in Argentina as well. Some of the top Argentinian rugby clubs also have, still have cricket clubs, but originally were yeah. better known as cricket clubs in, in Argentina. Yeah, now that's there. That, that's very interesting to hear. Um, just fascinating listening to you just speak about these facts and these different stories that many of the associate teams have, and I think. Many people uh, would would learn a lot from just listening to you on that. So that's very fascinating hearing you speak about that, Andrew. Um, I, I thought we'd talk about the growth and development of cricket within Europe in terms of getting cricket into local communities, clubs, gr- schools, grassroots, all that stuff. And, Andrew, you would agree this is one of the most difficult challenges for any associate nation in the world to do. Yes. How do you try and convince people to play a sport that is so foreign and it's not a part of the mainstream sort of sporting landscape. So many cricket boards ask themselves these questions. How do we get it into local communities? How do we make it accessible at your local park? You can go down to the nets, facilities, all that stuff. And even, you know, building talent like competitions, pathways, underage stuff, you know, to play international cricket for for that particular countries. And getting cricket into schools and their programs and sporting programs. So all these difficult questions. And also uh, one tournament that's doing that is the Europe- European Cricket League, which is mm-hmm. promoting cricket around Europe and travelling around Europe and different regions and countries and gives opportunities for players to play uh, in that tournament from associate nations, which is fantastic. And that's been going on since 2019. Um, obviously provides a bit of comedic effect. Sometimes there's viral videos that come out, which is hilarious. But that's that's a good thing for the game, I suppose, to get that exposure and attention on European cricket. So even though yeah, it's funny, 
but it's in a way it's a positive thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think one of one of the the good things about the European Cricket League is that you you only need to watch it, you only need to be on YouTube. And everybody can yeah. access YouTube. Yeah. So I think this is one of the problems that cricket has in in much of the world, uh, not just in Europe, but where it's on TV, it's on sort of your know, expensive subscription services or on yeah. streaming services that are targeted at the expat market. And I think you know, as I said, you know, I stumbled across cricket watching it on TV, um, on free TV, and I'm sure Bert has told you about um, the Netherlands in the 80s would get BBC One on sort of yeah. satellite and cable systems, and they, people would stumble across cricket that way. Now there isn't really a way to stumble across cricket, but the European Cricket League and their sort of myriad tournaments give a potential of stumbling across cricket and stumbling across cricket in your country. Uh, it's not, oh, oh, hang on, that's just down the road. I could yeah. go and... I can go and have a go there. Um, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it's, that, it's that phrase that you, you, you hear a lot, you, you, you cannot be what you cannot see. Right. Um, and you know, that, 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 that's very true as, as far as cricket goes. You know, the, often the big obstacle for cricket is, is money. Um, and I don't want to turn this into you know, bashing India or anything like that, because um, you know, that gets you a lot of negative attention on Twitter. But you know, mm. There are some associate members who get annual funding of about thirty thousand US dollars, mm. which doesn't really go so far in, um, you know, certainly in developed countries. Um, you know, and to put that into context, that is actually more money. That's like less money than the BCCI make per day from the ITC. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah. in fact, I think it might even be less than they make an hour, to be honest. Um, if you if you do the maths, so yeah. the, as I say, as I said earlier, you know, it's criminally underfunded in, in 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 some respects. And what I think one thing that will change is cricket being in the Olympics. Um, yeah. This is going to be massive for cricket in associate countries. For the teams that are actually going to be playing in the Olympics. Probably not going to have any impact, really. You know, Great Britain and Australia aren't going to gain from cricket being in the Olympics. India isn't going to gain anything from cricket being in the Olympics. Yeah. But um, you know, a lot of sort of countries where governments fund sport, they fund Olympic sports. Yeah. And you know, when uh, you know when I was talking to you know people who were trying to introduce the game into schools in their country, um, yeah, you. The first thing that like school boards tend to ask is, "Is this in the Olympics?" And as soon as you yeah. say no, they mm. lose interest. But if you can yeah. say yes, oh, now I'm interested. And you know, if it you can tell people, oh, it? yeah, massively, yeah, and it, you know, sponsors get attracted to things like that as well, and it, all of a sudden it becomes very e much easier to um, to fund these programs. And I think you. you Olympic cricket will lead to, and hopefully it will last a long time, because obviously it's going to be in 2028. 2032 yeah. is in Brisbane, so I assume they're going to include cricket as well. Yeah. It's looking like 2036 might be in Mumbai. So cricket obviously going to be part. So that cricket then becomes sort of more entrenched in the Olympics, and it can be a permanent yeah. part, perhaps will even become a permanent part of the Olympics, because the, the International Olympic Cricket, International Olympic Committee have wanted cricket for several years now, because yeah. it's that you know the Indian market is where they have the lowest reach, so they see well, cricket is a way to get that in that, those that big Indi Indian TV money. I think that I read that the the TV rights for the Olympics in 2028 in India will be worth almost 10 times as much because cricket is going to be in those Olympics. Yes. So it, it's big money for the IOC, so that's why they're interested in cricket. But that impact further down the line it essentially turns many associate members from having the ITC funding make up the majority of their revenue to making up a significant minority of their revenue. Yeah. And that changes the game slightly in terms of being able to put in these grassroots programs, being able to develop facilities, getting access to high performance you know, fun, you know, coaches and yeah. fitness and things like that. And um, the other big thing is that cricket will be on TV on regular normal tv not on obscure subscription services 
or it'll poor stream the, from the ICC or something like that. Yeah, you know, it will be on the other. It's still the equivalent of the BBC. It will be on the Mexican yeah, equivalent, yeah. Channel Seven or or whatever. Yeah. You know, it will be on national TV. You'll be able to see the best players playing cricket on TV. You'll be able to stumble across it, and that, I think that's you. Know, as I said, a lot of people have discovered cricket because they've stumbled across it. And anything that's going to make it easier for people to stumble across cricket is a good thing. As I say, for India, England and Australia, for New Zealand, for Pakistan, Olympic cricket yeah. is having no impact. No. Down the line, the teams that aren't even going to be playing in the Olympics, the impact will be massive. It will be transformative. As I say, it yep. turns cricket. It turns cricket into these countries into a major sport almost overnight. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of like with the T Twenty World Cup next year, with more teams, isn't it? Yeah, getting that more opportunity to associate nations. What do you think about that? Do you think that's a good move by the ICC uh, to increase the number of T Twenty? Definitely. World Cup? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm. I'm all for having bigger tournaments and bigger tournaments as well. That lets you have better formats. Um, I don't think they've quite got the format right for the, the, this, this World Cup. I don't like the second group stage. I'd rather them just go straight to yeah. knockouts after that first round. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, four groups of five, and then knockouts would be a nice quick turn. But you're adding that sort of second group stage, it just makes it drag on a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, people always talk about the 2007 World your ODI World Cup, which was 16 oh. teams. And oh, oh, it was terrible that first round with four groups of four. No, no, that wasn't the terrible part of that World Cup. That was the Super 8 stage. That was the one yeah. that dragged on for a month with Ireland and Bangladesh. And you're no disrespect to them sticking up, stinking up the place for, for, for a month. Um, whereas if the, that tournament had gone straight to quarterfinals, you'd have got Ireland and Bangladesh out of the way quickly and got to the business end of the tournament very yeah. quickly. And, you know, I think if they'd have done that, we'd probably still have a 16-team ODI World Cup today. But unfortunately, India slipped up and Pakistan slipped up and what should have been the big money India-Pakistan game in the Super 8 became Ireland against Bangladesh. Yeah. Again, no disrespect to those teams, but that's not what people are watching the World Cup for. Yeah. Um, well, they had some memorable moments in that World Cup. Yeah. They had wins, and they did pretty well yeah. and, um, in those victories. Yeah. And we've seen in the, you know, the most recent World Cup, some of the most memorable moments were the two Dutch victories. You know, yeah. um, And, you know... I think everybody, whenever when people ask what's your most memorable moments of the World Cup, most of the things they'll list will, will be results where associates of eight four members. Yeah. So you know, you know, people who grew up in the eighties, who well, school grew up in the seventies, I suppose, they will talk about Zimbabwe beating Australia in in the nineteen eighty three World Cup. I remember Zimbabwe beating England in the nineteen ninety two World Cup. Yeah. They'll you'll talk about Kenya beating the West Indies. They'll talk about you know Bangladesh beating Pakistan. They'll talk about yeah. Canada beating Bangladesh. They'll talk about Kenya in the 2003 World Cup getting to the semi-finals. Yeah, they'll talk about that catch Dwayne Leverworth took in 2007. <laughs> you know, the, the, these are the memorable moments. You know, these add color, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And, you know, I think, and it shows how cricket's going to have, has developed. You know, if you if you'd have looked at 2003, the 2003 World Cup where you had Zimbabwe and Kenya, where I think both made the Super Sixes in that World Cup, yeah. tell someone now that in 2024, there'll be three African teams at a World Cup and none of them will be Kenya or Zimbabwe. Yeah. You know, that, <laughs> that, that just shows how the game has developed. You know, Uganda yeah. and Namibia qualifying for the... For the, for the World Cup ahead of Zimbabwe. You know, Ireland very nearly slipped up as well in, in, in European qualifying. They beat Italy by, I think, only seven runs, and had they lost that game, they wouldn't, yeah. you know, they wouldn't have qualified. You would have seen Italy at, at the World Cup. So I think you know, that, that that just shows how how much the game has changed. And you know, I, I fully expect an associate to get to the last eight at that World Cup because all it takes is... You know, you beat the other associate in the group, you get one other win, results elsewhere go your way, and you threw on that run rate. It's not out of the question um, that an associate will get into that into that second round at the World Cup. Um, hopefully it doesn't come at the expense of India, because that will change things a lot. Um, and I'm glad as well that the it is a genuine 20-team World Cup. You know, it's not got this first round... Um, as was very incorrect. Everybody knew it was another qualifier. Um, yeah, 
element to it. Uh, you know, it's a genuine twenty team World Cup. Every team starts at the same point at the same stage, competing for the same goal, and it's it, it's better. I think one potential downside is the, as I say, whereas the Olympics will be on free to air TV, that's not necessarily going to be the case for an ICC tournament. So. Obviously, it's in the USA, so hopefully that'll get a bit of some eyeballs in the USA, and hopefully they do a good TV deal in the USA to try and get it on maybe ESPN. I think ESPN already covers some of the ICC tournaments, but on their streaming service, hopefully you can get it on the main sort of ESPN yeah. channel so that most people can stumble across it. And, yeah, I think it's a, it's a failing of the ICC sometimes to sell the TV rights to subscription services in in developing countries I, my yep. and i think the england recent a few for a few years would sell the rights for home test matches to youtube for continental europe mm. so that you could get watch you know, the, the the games on youtube and again that's ways for people to stumble across the sport you you you're not going to stumble across cricket if it's on a subscription service where you have to pay you know 30 quid a month yeah, you know, um, to, to get it uh, that's a cricket speciality service or yeah or whatever you're not going to stumble across cricket on icc.tv you know even people are trying to get cricket on icc.tv struggle and struggle to watch it um so mm. um yeah, i think you know, anything you you want cricket to be visible and then people will come and if sometimes i think cricket forgets about the let's try and make it visible I think there's an there's always an effort to grow players. You also need to grow fans. Yeah, now that's sometimes more important than growing players because um, nobody's going to start playing cricket if nobody's watching cricket. Yeah, that's also, right. You know, um, so yeah, being able to grow an audience for cricket is, I think, just as important as growing players. And cricket sometimes forgets that. Yeah, that's right. That's that's exactly right. We. We tend to forget that, as you say, um, about growing the game and helping each other out. Um, do you think the ICC can do, obviously, much better than they're doing now to um, encourage growth and development of associate cricket around the world? Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. A strange beast is the ICC. And I think, I'm sure you'll hear this a lot on this series, that there are, the ICC, there are multiple parts of the ICC. Mm. There are... There's the development arm, and there's a lot of very, you know, committed people in that that department. You know, really committed to growing the game and promoting the game around the world. They are sometimes hamstrung by the chief executive committee or the ICC board, where the full members have the biggest voice. Just and just to put this into perspective, on the ICC board, the twelve full members all get a vote, but then the ninety-four associate members get three votes between them. Mm. That. Isn't doesn't strike me as particularly fair, um, it's, um, and hence decisions tend to be made to benefit the few and not the many, and that's one of the big problems I think with the, with the cricket one. So the ICC is you've got a department that wants to do a lot, but are sometimes prevented from doing a lot by the people who actually who are just trying to look after their own self interest, and you know people can look after their own self interest, but I think the People who run the game have a duty to the to the game as a whole, and I think they often forget that. You know, because in the end, if only India, England, and Australia are funded well, then eventually only India, England, and Australia are going to be playing cricket. Um, you know, because yeah. you you need to have teams to play, and if you don't look after that sort of grassroots, you know, and in the end. For most full members, there's not actually really that much more growth. You know, can you make cricket any more popular in Australia? Can you make it any more popular in India? Probably not. Yeah. You can make it a hell of a lot more popular in Uganda and more popular in Argentina or yeah. USA or Turkey. Yeah, there's a lot of growth potential there. You know, yeah. and I think the ICC the ICC almost leave money on the table by not spending money to grow the game. You've got you know, Nigeria is a good example. We're a very a growing force in African cricket. Obviously, they played in the global qualifier for the T20 World Cup in 2019. Um, <coughs> and they've played in an under 19 World Cup as well. And 
Africa in general is a major growth area for, for cricket, especially women's cricket. Um, yep. Why it's a bit of a scandal that no African team can qualify for the Women's ODI World Cup other than Zimbabwe and South Africa. Because um, only teams with ODI status are going to be allowed to qualify. No African team has, no African associate has ODI status in women's cricket. Um, you know, we saw Rwanda, obviously, at the Women's Under 19 World Cup earlier this year, beating the West Indies and Zimbabwe. You know, imagine telling someone that Rwanda would beat the West Indies mm. even two years ago, <laughs> never mind, <laughs> never mind, 10 years ago. Yeah, and because I'm mean, Rwanda are a, a sort of a good example of where cricket is growing in a, in a different way because you know, Rwanda's a francophone country, it doesn't have a history of British colonialism. You know, you see Mali as well, who sort of made headlines a few years ago when they conceded 300 in a T20I, in a women's T20I. And obviously recently you've seen Chile concede 400 in a women's T20I. Um, yeah. And then Argentina score a 1,000 runs in a three-match series, which is you know, barely believable. And I think mm. you know, expanding T20I status has helped this because although those records happen and you see and you, people are sort of shocked by them, would anybody be talking about an Argentina the Chile women's match if it wasn't a T20I? Probably not. No, no. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, expanding T20I status has been probably the most progressive move the ICC have ever made. And your know, cricket administrators around the world are not known for their progressive opinions. Um, but in this case, they were, and they've done something quite spectacular there. I think getting quicker into the Olympic as well is a very progressive move. Um, so I think there, there are there's there's positives. Um, there's always the risk of the ICC screwing things up because, um, <laughs> um, as I say, self interest sometimes rules at the ICC. Because obviously yeah. you know, cricket didn't get into the Olympics for so long because India didn't want cricket in the Olympics. Yeah. And, and England didn't want cricket in the Olympics for a long time as well. England used to say that, oh, cricket being in the Olympics would cause us to cancel four test matches in the summer. It's like, well, the Olympics has only last two weeks and the cricket men's cricket tournament is really going to last one week. Mm. Why would that cause the cancellation of four test matches? That yeah. doesn't really add up. Um, and then India didn't want cricket in the Olympics because it was it would mean more government oversight. But I think anybody who watched the the recent World Cup knows that the relationship between the BCCI and the Indian government is uh, very intertwined these days. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so you know things have changed for the better. Um, as I, I'm always you know I'm a natural cynic, and I'm I'm always worried that something's going to happen to mess things up. Um, yeah. It, you know, there's there's, lo there's long histories of things happening. You're know, growing the World Cup and then shrinking it back down. Um, saying you're going to expand the T20 World Cup and then saying actually that we're going to add this preliminary round to it. There's 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 this history. So I think I'm naturally you know, I mean, anybody who's been involved in associate cricket who's been a fan of associate cricket. You start out so sort of wide eyed and sort of positive and wanting to you know spread the gospel uh, as it yeah. were and then eventually you become sort of bitter twisted and cynical and uh, you know, I've, I've been you know sort of covering it for over 20 years now and um I've, I've become very bitter twisted and cynical um but i was to some extent i was like that to start with um but yeah i'm i'm yeah cautiously optimistic for for the growth of cricket you know especially as i say with the 20 team t20 world cup the ODI World Cup's growing again uh, to 14 teams next time. Cricket's getting in the Olympics and hopefully we'll be, become entrenched in the Olympics. It's getting into the regional sport, regional games as well. Obviously, it's been in and out of the Pacific Games for a while. Came back into the Asian Games this year. It's going to be in the African Games next year. It's going to be in the next Pan American Games. These are all sort of important things for um, your associate members in these countries because you know, if cricket's in the Pan American Games... An associate is definitely going to play in that. An associate is definitely going to be playing in the African Games. Might not necessarily qualify for the Olympics, but for these regional events, they will they will be playing in because there's not enough teams to to go around. So you'll you're going to see more investment will happen because that is happening. 
um, governments will get more interested, schools will get more interested in terms of getting cricket onto the curriculum. And as long as the ICC doesn't do anything to screw it up, it's, yeah, uh, that's, that's it's, the main thing. Fingers crossed. That's, that's the main thing. thing. Yeah. Fingers crossed. And let's hope the ICC uh, continue to, well, not think about themselves for a change and think about others and help out yeah. the global game, which is which is what cricket's about. It's, it's about helping each other out and growing the game and the sport. And yeah. We haven't quite seen that. Um, yeah. You know, cricket, 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 as I said earlier, cricket preaches fair play. Well, let's mm. practice what we preach. Let's be That's fair. right. Yeah. But you know, powers of B, and that's that's their agenda, and that's what they want to try and think about their own pockets and their own self interest. So yeah. hopefully that changes um, as the years come and as we progress throughout the years uh, to see, try to yeah. grow the game globally. Um, yeah, you see, you see a good example of that with the ODI Super League, which yeah. was launched and then collapsed because yeah. India, Australia, and England lost interest, but now Australia has had a change of your know, cricket oh. administrators and now they want the Super League back. So you, you see, you know, there's, there's no sort of consistency. You know, I, I, Can you remember the last time the World Cup, this was the, I guess the first time the World Cup has had the same format for two tournaments in a row. For, you know, when, when It's never had the same format for three tournaments in a row. You know, oh, it's, had, yeah. it's always chopped and changed. It's yeah. always chopping and changing. You know, that, and that lack of consistency makes it very hard to plan when you're uh, an yeah. amateur associate board, when you you don't know. You almost you, you, you don't know where your next meal is coming from, to use that. Use yeah. a bit of a cliche. You, you, you don't know what the pathway is going to be. You know, still, still now, we don't really know 100% what the qualifying, how qualifying is going to work for the next World Cup. There's sort of bits and bobs coming out, but nobody's made a formal announcement. You know, yeah. a, there was a classic example during that during the World Cup where it turned out nobody actually knew that this was a, also a qualifier from the Champions Trophy. Yes. I mean, they don't. Yeah. The, the, this communication doesn't happen, so people don't know what the pathway is. And if you don't know what the pathway is, it's hard to sort of get attract sponsorship. If you don't know what, are we actually going to be playing a qualifying tournament next year, this year? Obviously yeah. not now. I mean, in December, you'd know whether you're playing a qualifying tournament or not. But you know, I think you know, a lot of there's a lot of associate members and some of the top associate members as well who don't know what their fixtures are going to be for the next 12 months. Yeah. That's not the case for England, Australia, or India. No. They know exactly what their fixtures are. You know, we I think we know what England's fixtures are in 2025. Yeah, you know, home fixtures at least. So you, so you can do long term planning if you don't know whether you're going to get any matches or not. You can't long plan for the long term. You can't attract sponsors. You can't yeah, say right. to a sponsor, "We're going to be playing ten matches on TV next year. We can get your company's logo on TV around the world." Yes, but if you That's don't right. know and you're going to have any matches, you can't get those sponsors. So, yeah. Yeah, so so I think some some forward planning, some consistency, and some long term thinking, and I think the ICC as well also need to recognise that their product is international cricket, and they need to promote that product. You'll often see you know, the ICC will be running a qualifier for the T Twenty World Cup, and we'll be tweeting about the IPL. Yeah, why why are you doing that? You don't run the IPL. No. Yeah. <laughs> why why are you promoting a competitor? Um, you know, it's, it'd be like it'd be like you know, Pepsi t- tweeting about Coca Cola almost. You know, it's yeah. like, why, why would you do that? Um, yeah, and you know, and, and you know, un- unless you're saying, well, if you like this, well, unless you're saying Coca Cola is rubbish, let's you know, that's the only time you should talk. Pepsi should, yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> you say, you know, the, so you'll see the ICC will tweet about the IPL whilst they're running a qualifying tournament and they won't know they'll mention the IPL more than the tournament they're actually running there's actually yeah. their, their products why 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 do that um so yeah I mean, promote things better and yeah plan plan better be more consistent and think about other people for a change <laughs> yeah that's right but also another thing I wanted to raise with you Andrew is um the future of ODI cricket and that's you know, probably going to be 
gone altogether or whatever. And that will be at a disadvantage for associate cricket as well because they mainly play ODIs and T20s. That's it. They don't play test matches because they um, don't have that sort of status or may not achieve that sort of um, uh, that goal or aspiration to play test cricket. So if one day cricket was to disappear, as many people are talking about, how, how would that affect associate cricket in terms of those teams relying on two formats of the game, which they play a lot of cricket? Um, yeah, I think you know, it's important to say you, you, for, for associate members, 50 over cricket is the longest form mm. that they play. And the ICC has not been very good at, you know, the, the actual, you know, the qualification pathway for the 2000, for this year's ODI World Cup was some of the best ODI cricket that's mm. happened in a long time. You know, you had Nepal winning you know, 11 out of the last 12 matches to, to qualify for the World Cup qualifier. You you, know, you had all the, you had these great tri-series um, you know, in that time. The World Cup qualifier itself, you know, that, that Netherlands the West Indies game, which I will say is one of the best ODIs ever played. Nobody saw it, hardly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, over here, you know, Sky Sports had the rights to show that game and didn't show it. Mm. And you know, you know, you've got 380 tied with 380, and then a super over where a guy scores 30 runs and takes two wickets. That's a good game of cricket. Why wasn't that on yeah. TV? Why wasn't that being promoted more? Um, you know, you so cricket shoots itself in the foot sometimes where it has a great product. And I don't, I, I dislike talking about. Um, cricket as a product, almost, but it, you know, it, you, in in reality, it is a product. And yeah, it's if, a, it's a got, if, you, if 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 you've got a great product, why aren't you promoting it? You know, yeah, you've got a really solid product here. And I, I, I you know, as I said, I think when I got into associate cricket, I enjoyed it because of that organised structure to international cricket. I think if you can bring full members into that properly. Not do it a bit sort of half-assed like they, they have done in the, with the Super League and with the World Test Championship. If you can structure international cricket properly, um, then I think that's for the benefit. I, I've, all, I've for a long time thought if you you could very easily have you know a separate sort of four-year cycle for each form, whereas for and then each year you have a global event. You have a Test Championship one year. You have an you have a T20 World Cup the next, you have an ODI World Cup the next year, and you have the Olympics in, in the fourth year. You can you can sort of you can structure international cricket like that. So everybody has a pathway, everybody knows what matches they're going to be playing and when. But cricket, as I say, it's still run like it, it's the 19th century and it's okay just to get anywhere and you couldn't see the best players on TV every week. <laughs> you know, so you know, cricket, I think at the full member level, needs to move with the times and start thinking about the way it's structured and the product it's putting out there. You know, the the Island v Zimbabwe series that I started the other day is a classic example of that. That's not being shown on TV in Zimbabwe or Ireland. Yeah. Why? <laughs> and it's not on and okay, it's not on TV, but and I think the the ultimate question answer to that why is because it doesn't really count for anything. Yeah. And I think why broadcasters have moved to franchise cricket, franchise cricket has a narrative. It has, Each tournament has a beginning, a middle and an end, whereas test cricket doesn't have a beginning, a middle and an end. It's just, it just happens. It's, um, yeah. you know, you're watching, you you start, you're watching the middle of the film. You're not watching the, the you know, the start and the end. There's no ending there's no consequence for losing there's no Argentina are a good example of this they they were in the world cricket league they got up to the division two of the world cricket league so one division below ODI status then they lost um about 20 games in a row and they got relegated to division three to division four to division five to division six and now are the tournament out of the structure altogether if England lose 20 games in a row nothing happens hmm. but what if it did yeah what your right. Australia between the 2015 and 2019 World Cup played absolutely terrible in ODI cricket. What if they'd have got relegated? Yeah. 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 You would take international cricket more seriously. You would want 
mm-hmm. to play better. You would, I think, you would care more. You know, when there's no consequences, it's hard to care. And I think if you've got uh, the World Test Championship, I, I, I like, but there's no consequences for finishing last. Yeah, I think even in fact, I think seventh, eighth, and ninth all get the same prize money in that tournament. What if ninth had to have a playoff against Zimbabwe for mm. to stay in the tournament? You know, what if? Um, and cricket is a has a long history of what ifs. And you know, it would be nice if we didn't have to say a what if anymore. No, that's right. But that's just the way it is. Um, yeah. and, and another thing before we move on, Andrew, from this topic, is um, some of the uh, franchise leagues, they have some associate players playing in mm-hmm. some leagues, which is fantastic. Um, will we see more? Associate players get into these leagues like the BBO, IPO, etc. I, I I hope so. Um, I I think associate players are often criminally undervalued in in yeah. franchise leagues. I think the ICC have introduced a rule now where um, there's a, I think there's now a cap on how many associate how many overseas spots you can have, but you can have one extra overseas spot if it's an associate player. I think that that may have a a positive impact as and as well on, on another thing as well if you've because now if you're an associate player you're more valuable to a franchise league um because and that may encourage associate players who can play for a full member as well to maybe stay with the associate member because if tim david had carried on playing for singapore and this rule was in place all of a sudden he's got an extra slot to take up in that franchise league if he's a Singapore player. Whereas if he's an Australia player, he takes up one of the standard overseas players. So, yeah. so you, you might see more more teams stick with the, the associate member that they're part of rather than try and qualify for a member. So that would be beneficial. Um, as I say, though, associate cricketers are notoriously undervalued in these franchise leagues. Um, I think franchise leagues are quicker to pick you know, no disrespect to them, but you know, sort of mediocre Australian and South African players than they are better sometimes um associate member players. Um Kamal Leverock from Bermuda, who's Dwayne Leverock's nephew, that's his Twitter handle. Um, um was sort of bemoaning his sort of absence from franchise T twenty. And you know, he's a very talented uh spin bowler who I think would slot very well into you know maybe perhaps not the IPL but certainly you know, this you know, the Caribbean Premier League or the Big Bash League yeah. or the hundred in England. You know, he would fit very well into a into a league like that and, and perform very well, but he doesn't he doesn't get a look in because he's an associate player. And I think there's a there's still a stigma about associate players. I think and yeah. this even happens within associate countries as well. You know, you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of times where you find an Australian with you know, who's got a passport for an associate country and he'll just walk into the team no matter what because he's Australian. You know, sometimes your know, associate members get get lucky. You know, everybody will remember John Davison for Canada. But for yeah. every every John Davison, there's a Stuart Heaney. And if you're saying who's Stuart Heaney, that sort of beats my point. But he, he had a similar background to John Davison. He, he was born in Canada to parents who were working there. And he ended up... He was involved with the Australian Cricket Academy and he had this Canadian passport. Someone from Cricket Canada thought, all right, we'll pick him then. He's Australian, he must be good. And he wasn't. <laughs> and he, he failed miserably. He didn't do what John Davison did because you don't always strike gold. And I think there's, um, there is sometimes, as I say, this stigma against homegrown talent in associate countries where it, or if he's been playing in Australia, he must be good. He must be better than what we're producing. I think yeah. associate cricket, sorry, associate cricket sometimes sells itself short. Um, and but if other if everybody else is saying associate cricket isn't as good as full member cricket, and you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that you know all associate players could play the IPL. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm not stupid. Um, but there's a lot of talent in associate member countries. Yeah. And, that often gets overlooked. It's happening. There are. It's happening more. I think people are getting, are learning more about um, the talent that's there in associate countries. You, you, I think the the Fairbreak tournament in in Hong Kong 
was a good example of that where you had you know Rwandan players playing alongside English players and yeah. uh, alongside there's a Swedish player played in that in the fair break tournament uh, this year you you see and you have a Rwandan player bowling out an English player you know that's that's amazing that 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 can happen and I think that's a that's a good example of that whilst the the national teams might not be able to compete individual players can compete um I think unfortunately in international cricket that you if you've got one really good player and that really good player has a bad day, then the, your your team's going to lose. Yeah. Um, but that one player can play really well as part of a wider franchise setup. So, I'm not anti-franchise cricket uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's it's always described as a battle between franchise cricket and international cricket. I think they can yeah. coexist as long as both are managed correctly. And as we've just discussed, <laughs> that's not yeah. always the case. No, no, it's not. <laughs> But um, yeah, um, obviously it's you know just one of those things. I suppose in cricket, is you know it's it's like talking to a brick wall. You know nothing gets done. You know you hammer yeah. away, you hammer away, and then nothing gets done. You know, so we just need the ICC to have a change of mindset. That's all. And once yeah, you have you, that, then you yeah. you're on your way. You, you, know? Know, you know, a lot a lot of people in in the ICC will talk a good game about growing the game. Oh well, yeah, of course we want more people, more countries to be playing cricket, but we don't want to give up our spot. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. um, it's that sort of um, elitism that you know people will be aware of in England with the ICCEC report about, um, you know, obviously it covered racism, but it also covered classism, and there's a lot of that in in cricket where there's this thing of, oh, an associate member can never be good. The people will will say that oh cricket's never you know, you're never going to get a good Danish player, despite all evidence of the contrary. That there's a Danish guy who's played cricket for England and there's who have yeah. been very successful in county cricket. They will say oh Denmark can't actually be a good team. Well, Denmark yeah. nearly qualified for a World Cup. You know, hmm. <laughs> you know, there was a time when the USA was the third best team in the world behind England yeah. and Australia. The what the, there have been moments for associate cricket where it's competed, but I think there's a tendency to put up barriers. It's that, yeah, it'd be nice if it'd be nice if Uganda, if um, not Uganda's a bad example because they've just qualified for World Cup, but you know, it'd be nice if um, Fiji qualified for a World Cup, yeah. But do we want them to qualify for a World Cup at the expense of India? But <laughs> um, cricket needs to have another another other countries that it's played in because if anything happens to the big countries this is the thing about the west indies everybody's also cricket needs a strong west indies yeah it only needs a strong west indies because you're not making other teams strong you know your, yeah. your football is a good example of this where hungary were one of the best teams in the world in the 50s now of nowhere they don't qualify for the world cup they think they only only just qualified for the European Championship for the first time in, in in decades. Yeah, but nobody talks about oh, football needed a strong hung, needs a strong Hungary because there yeah. were other teams that were allowed to sort of rise and 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 replace. And that's a real tragedy of West Indian cricket. That there's nothing for them to drop into. Yeah, because there's as much as there's a glass ceiling, there's a glass floor as well. Yeah, <laughs> you know that you can't go down through. Whereas, yeah. Because the uh, you know the ideal situation for the West Indies would be that they do drop down and then they play more against teams that they can beat and they can get back up and get build confidence and start coming back up to, back up again. But there's nothing for them to drop into. So no. just as that sort of hard barrier between full members and associate members that yes. um, you know it's the Black Knight in Monty Python saying none shall pass and yeah. um, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and that's changing. I think the more that you're seeing associate members play with full members, you're seeing that that line doesn't really exist. It's a figment of people's imaginations for the most part. That when, when yeah. associate, you've seen now associate members competing for qualification spots with full members, whereas previously full members just got automatic entry to every tournament. You know, yeah. as, as, I, as, I, as I've often said, you know, the, the last this most recent World Cup, 
It was technically the first World Cup that England qualified for. They've never qualified for a Cricket World Cup before. <laughs> it, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, um, so because they've always got automatic entry. Whereas now, when you see four members having to play in qualifying tournaments with associate members, sometimes you see an associate members beat them and qualify instead of them. We've seen that in the T20 World Cup. We saw it in the ODI World Cup. So that line doesn't really exist. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who have a very sort of strong interest in keeping that line there. And yeah, that's right. they're the people who control cricket, which is yeah. a shame. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Andrew, uh, we've come to the end of our discussion, but there's one more topic still to talk about, and we've already touched on it a little bit, and that's looking into the crystal ball, looking into the future of associate cricket and also cricket in Europe as well. I, I know it's very hard to predict the future because you don't know what's going to happen. But, Andrew, if you had to predict the future how do you see european cricket and associate cricket going into the future is it going to be strong is it going to suffer many challenges obstacles what's your take so i think I, i'm i'm probably more optimistic about the future than i have been for a long time yeah as, as, as we've discussed already cricket in the olympics is is the big game changer that is going to help get cricket into schools get sponsors get governments interested in 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 funding cricket, uh, that 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 is the is the big big change. So it's it's not an, it's not an impact that's going to happen overnight. It's not even going to happen in the next ten years. We probably won't see the impact for another twenty years. Um, you know, by which time I'll be you know, you know getting on a bit, and but hopefully still still be around to watch it. Um, yeah. I think there will be more countries in Europe and around the world pushing out the World Cup. At the, at the T20 World Cup and hopefully maybe even the ODI World Cup if it still exists in 20 years. You know, I think you will see, obviously we've all, for a long time we've seen you know, three or four European countries at a World Cup. I think we'll start to see five or six European countries at a World Cup. And especially as well in the women's game, the women's game is expanding rapidly throughout the world. You know, we spoke about Rwanda at the Women's Under-19 World Cup this year. You know, there's massive growth happening in Africa and in South America and in Europe and in Asia as well. And you know, I think the benefit of women's cricket in Asia is so in a lot of these countries, women don't play sport other than cricket. Um, so you you've got an opportunity, a real opportunity for growth in women's cricket. So unfortunately, the ICC sometimes don't realise that, but I think um, there are people who do realise that and are. Are trying to push push the game there. I think so. I think the the I think women's cricket and men's cricket are going to look very different. I mean, we already see a bit of that in associate world. You know, the Thailand men's team, for example, are absolutely nowhere in terms of international. Cricket. They're nowhere near qualifying for a World Cup. The Thailand yeah. women's team do qualify for World Cups. You know, the um, women's cricket in Europe as well as so Austria and Germany are amongst the the very top teams in women's cricket. In associate wise, but that's not necessarily the case in in men's cricket. So you're gonna, I think you're gonna see more not a separation in terms of how is it, you know how the games are, are are administered, but in terms of the teams that are involved, I think you'll see yeah. very different teams at the top of the women's game, and certainly in associate cricket, and then you then you will in men's cricket. Uh, I think cricket will get mo become more popular. I think there will be. And, and some of that will be demographic changes. There will be more immigration from cricket playing countries, but some of that will happen because, again, cricket is in the Olympics, and that will be a cricket a bigger sport, and it will get more people interested in cricket. So I think it's going to grow yeah. from a participation point and a spectator point as well. And so, yeah, I am optimistic that in 20 years there will be more strong cricket playing countries competing for World Cup spots and that we will see eventually a day where one of those top four members doesn't qualify for a World Cup. I think we will see a day when England doesn't play a World Cup. I am optimistic that that will happen. And I know that sounds very odd as someone who's English. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think English people, to some extent, like misery. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and I think, you know, people think, oh, it would be terrible if India doesn't play in a World Cup. But, you know, you... Yeah. Germany don't qualify for every cricket World Cup, every football World Cup, sorry. Brazil sometimes lose out in the first round. 
it's if 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 your game if your sport requires certain countries to always be involved at the top of the game you don't have a healthy sport but i think cricket is has the potential to become a healthier sport in the next sort of 20 years yeah absolutely. it feels very odd it feels very odd to be positive so yeah, i'll stop well, you have to <laughs> You you got to be positive, I suppose. You got to be optimistic and just believe and hope that you know mm-hmm. one day that cricket itself can grow and par- prosper and be a, a very flourishing game around the world, which many people should enjoy because cricket's a game for all, isn't? Isn't that right? So yeah, unfortunately, it's not always been the case, but it, it, it hasn't it, always been the case. But it is it, it is a game for all and should be a game for all, and hopefully it becomes a game for more in, in the yeah. future. Absolutely. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for for joining me today. We've spoken for one and a half hours on Associate Cricket. We can go on all day. We could speak for a very long time, but um, maybe we have to come ask you back for another episode to to talk more about Associate Cricket in greater detail. But I've thoroughly enjoyed it today. Uh, If people want to get in touch with you, Andrew, if if they want to do that or ask you some questions, where can they do that? Where can they find you? So I'm on I'm on uh, Twitter or the website formerly known as Twitter, whatever Elon's calling it today. Um, that's at Andrew Nixon seven nine. I'm on uh, Mastodon and Blue Sky as well. I post occasionally on there. Uh, so yeah, those are the places you can find me. Um, and I'm I'm always open to answer questions as, as long as you behave yourself. Um, <laughs> Um, I have a very um, short fuse on blocking people. <laughs> so yeah. um, I am. If 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 you if you have an open mind, then I'm then I'm interested to talking to you. So yeah, I'll, yeah. I am I am available on social media uh, quite regular, probably a bit too much, but um, yeah. that's that's, a, that's yeah. another, another topic. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll leave a link to to those in the uh, description of this episode. And before we go, remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. So the podcast is available on Anchor, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. Once again, thank you, Andrew, for joining me today. Thank you, Special Things European Cricket and Associate Cricket. I hope all of you watching or listening to this Associate Cricket Series episode learnt a lot more about uh, European cricket and Associate Cricket from Andrew today in our chat. Until next time, keep safe and bye for now.